Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of Origin Story, where we dive into how your favorite YouTubers got started and where they are going. I am Mike. And I'm JP. And today our guest is Ryan Van Duzer. Ryan, thanks for joining us tonight. He's going to be sharing us a little bit about his past and why he created his YouTube channel. So we're excited to have you here today. Thanks I'm for joining us. excited to be here, guys. Thank you. Yeah, I, we were talking before we started recording. I'm so excited from our little break. Um, we did have a little break. I had a little baby, so uh, I need some time to sleep and get settled. But I'm glad to come back with someone who's so positive. So um, it's going to be a really fun conversation here. So for those who don't know our guest today, Ryan Van Duzer is an eternal optimist born and raised in the foothills of the Rockies. He's an ultra marathon runner, a mountain biker, a hiker, a vegetarian, and a lover of everything outdoors. His self-titled YouTube channel is home to 128,000 subscribers and growing who have watched his over 837 videos 19 million times. That is probably one of the highest numbers that we've had, but... We talked about this a little earlier. He's also been one of the earliest adopters of YouTube. I think January 5th, 2006. So a couple months after YouTube started, he was on the platform. I know old school. Yeah. old school. Been around. But you, you have, your channel has grown into a very new age and you've modernized your channel with everything from first to current video. So over these past 15 years, one thing that hasn't changed is the message behind the channel. Mm -hmm. You just want people to get off the couch, go outside and enjoy the world that we live in. I love that because, you know, sometimes you see channels changing and hopping around to try and stay modern, but you're true to who you are and what it is. And I love that here. So tune into his channel when, you know, at, what is it? Weekly. Yeah, usually every week I put up a new video. Sometimes yeah. two videos a week. It depends. I don't have a strict schedule. That's a Honestly. good way. We'll talk about your schedule and all those a little later. So tune in weekly to see where he's going, what he's doing. If he's running a, an ultra marathon, if he's going on a bike ride, if he's just going on a hike or talking about his life. It's really, really amazing community to be a part of. I'm so happy to have you on here. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast and telling your origin story. It's an honor to be here with you guys and congrats on your new baby. That's exciting. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is hectic on uh, Sunday. We tried to go get uh, a family picture because we thought that'd be really nice. Yeah. So we have a uh, three week old and a 20 month old and the 20 month old was just gone. Literally put him down. He ran away. He didn't want to have be held. It's, it's just like, you got to just kind of roll with it. It's kind of how we're yep. going, but it's, it's fun, man. I totally forgot about all of the baby things and was onto the toddler life. And now I've been sucked back in. <laughs> well, congrats. That's cool. Thanks. Thanks. It's fun. Round two. Ryan. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for coming. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. First question. What are you running from? No, um, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, no, but my I, mom I appreciate... wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because you're a multifaceted guy. So we're, we're going to cover a lot of that today. Um, but I guess like starting out, one of the questions that, that we had is um, obviously uh, University of Boulder, correct? Um, so you studied in journalism. And so I guess just out of the gate there, what was your goal? Like, did you have a, a mindset like when you were growing up as far as to get into, you know, being a writer or being on TV or being a TV host or anything like that um, growing up? And tell us a little bit more about that degree, why you chose it. I've always been a creative person and I express myself uh, best through non-traditional outlets. So in high school, if we had an option to write like an essay or do like a creative project, I would always choose the creative project because I, you know, writing just blew my brain up. But, I, you know, if I get my hands on a video camera and do something fun, that's what I did. And I was I loved MTV. When I was a kid, I wanted to be like a host of like Total Request Live or even be on the real world or something like that. I just thought it was it seemed like a really cool job. Like you get to go around the world and like interview people and play music and, and go on adventures. And that's your job. And as a young person, that was really influential to me. And then in college, I got a degree in broadcast journalism. And I love that. You know, I've always been a storyteller and one uh, one way. And, uh, it's always been, mostly been through video. And I did an internship my senior year of college at the local NBC station in Denver at the news channel. And I learned very quickly that I didn't want to do local news because we all, if you watch local news, it's kind of sad and depressing. And I was like, I don't want to be part of this. I want to make happy news. I want to make 
inspirational stories. And so I did that internship, which was very valuable, knowing that that's not what I wanted to do in life and that I wanted to do something completely different. When I graduated, instead of going into the journalism world, I joined the Peace Corps and I lived in Honduras for two years, which was an incredibly valuable two years of my life. And I'm doing this really quickly. But when I finished my Peace Corps service after two years, instead of flying home, you know, the Peace Corps was going to give me a, a plane ticket to go home. I cashed in my plane ticket, bought a bicycle and decided that the best way to go home would be to ride my bike from Honduras to Boulder, 4,000 miles through Central America and Mexico. And so that was really my first true adventure. And it just it lit me up inside. It, I've never felt so alive. And I had a little Sony Handycam that was recording to little DV tapes this was before digital. Yep. And I filmed a lot of the adventure as I went home hoping that someday I would make a documentary or something. This is way before YouTube or even any type of digital video. And so I, when I got home, I edited this short video together and I submitted it to the Travel Channel because at the time they had a show where they would buy essentially vacation footage from people around the world and make this little clip show. And they bought my footage for $500. I thought it was big time. Big money. Big money. And it played on the Travel Channel. And from that moment, I was like, I want to be an adventure travel show host. And so I put all of my energy into accomplishing that dream. And we'll stop. Yeah, what, I have two questions. What do, you, what do you, real quick, well, what do you think about like, what was it from getting on Travel Channel that made you love that too? Because I mean, there's a lot of like things that maybe it's like, hey, I'm, I'm doing something and people are watching it. Like what was your kind of gratification that made you say, I love this? That's a great question. I just, I love the idea of sharing stories with the world that hopefully would inspire them to go outside of their comfort zones, whether that's just getting on an airplane and traveling somewhere new or challenging them, challenging themselves physically, or just, you know, showcasing interesting stories. You know, a lot of people can't travel. They don't have the money. So TV is the way that they travel. And I thought that I would be a good guy to tell these stories. I know I'm energetic, I'm fun, or at least I think I am. And that's how it all started. That's I would awesome. say 130,000 other people who have hit that button think that as well. Plus 19 million views. So yeah, they hit that button. Yeah. So I have two questions. One of which is kind of about the video camera. And you brought this camera with you to the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you had enough tape or, or, or function with you to, yep. to house all this media. When did you start getting into cameras? Like what was, what was the, the what was the, the reason why you started yeah. to film yourself and start to create these movies? Because most people, until this came around. Yeah. It was, you had to have a physical device that was a separate item for video. Yeah. It not wasn't, a lot it of wasn't people. for jackass. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, I wasn't a jackass guy, although I was entertained by that, but not a lot of people had video cameras. College students, it's just not something you had. They cost like a thousand dollars. And why would you have a video camera? Cause it's, you know, nowhere to broadcast it except for your, you know, family videos or something. So my senior year, I was a broadcast student. So I was used to using, video cameras and shooting and editing, you know, little news stories for the campus TV. And my present to myself, my senior year when I graduated was buying this little Sony Handycam, which was like a thousand dollars. It was the Sony DCR PC9. I'll never forget the model because I lusted after this camera forever. And I finally got it. And I, I knew that I wanted to document my experience in, in Honduras in some way, shape or form. And so I did film a lot of my life down there as well. But really, the, the meat of the, uh, the story and where I used that camera was on the bike ride home. And so, OK, so that leads me to the second question I had is I don't, in my mind, buying bikes in the U.S., mainly in Florida, lots of bikes to choose from, lots of good bikes to choose from. You have a lot of items, you know, you can choose different tire sizes, all that kind of stuff. You can go to a store and upgrade your bike. Honduras, I've spent a lot of time in Costa Rica. I don't know if I would see a bike that I would want to ride from yeah. Honduras to Denver or to yeah. Boulder. So what was the process of like finding a bike there? Did you get one shipped in? How'd you find that bike? So very good question, because most of the bikes that are sold in Central America are kind of cheapy Chinese Walmart-esque bikes. You know, they're just not high quality and there's no way that they would be able to go 4,000 miles from Honduras to Boulder. So I actually, I was at a bar one night and I met another American guy who was down in Honduras 
working for a non-governmental organization. I forget which one, but we were just chatting. And I told him that I was looking for a real bike, like not one of these junkers. And he's like, I actually have a Trek mountain bike that I'm going to sell because I'm leaving. I've been here for three years and I'm leaving. I'll sell it to you for 500 bucks. And I was like, yes, I want your bike. And so that's how I got my bike. And I was very lucky to, to meet this gentleman. And of course, I was in the Hon- I was in Honduras Peace Corps. I didn't have five hundred dollars, so I remember having to call my mom and saying, "Hey, mom, can you send a five hundred dollar check to this guy's sister in San Francisco, and then he'll <laughs> give me the bike in Honduras?" And that's how it happened. And so, when you were in Honduras, like you, you make this decision, and obviously, it seems like there's some fate that's telling you, "Okay, this is the right decision." The guys there got the bike. You're having a drink. He's like, "I got a bike." You've got, get the money situation all settled out pretty simply, but you know, riding 4,000 miles is no joke. Like riding a hundred miles is, is, is an accomplishment for many people to the century, right? They accomplish that. Were you doing any training when you were there? Like, were you just, was it just hiking, walking? What was going on? You know, I've always been a, a fairly active athletic human. I've always ridden a bike everywhere I go. Here's a fun fact about me. I've never had a car in my life. I commute by bike everywhere. I got my license at age 32, but only so I could host some Land Rover commercials. <laughs> so um, that that's kind of um, the story there is I, um, I, uh, I kind of lost, forgot what I was talking about. I was talking about this bike and how I got it. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and you're talking about like, were you doing any training while you were there? Yes, exactly. Training. Um, I'm always running or biking or something, but I wasn't training hard. I knew that the ride would train me as I went. It's a lot of commit. It's a lot of commitment though. I mean, were you younger? Were you, did you play a lot of sports? Did you do things like that? Like, cause I mean, there's a big difference between like, being like, it'd be cool. And being like, I'm actually pedaling on, and I have 3,999 miles to go. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I, um, I've always been a runner and an endurance athlete. And so it didn't really intimidate me. I knew that every day I would just ride and get as far as I would get and then camp somewhere and wake up and do it again and again and again. And then I would get stronger as I went. And I, for some reason, I wasn't too intimidated by it. You know, now looking back on it, I'm like, that's kind of crazy to think that I should just get on a bike and ride home. <laughs> my mom definitely thought it was crazy. And all of my friends were telling me not to do it. But I, I had the time of my life. Through, yeah, and through Central America, too. It's not like it's not like gonna, we'll talk about another one that you did. It's not like you're riding across the United States, right? Yeah. Were there any sketchy moments? There actually were never any sketchy moments. And what I found on this ride was that, you know, people who they portray on the news as bad guys aren't often bad guys. And if you watch American news, going back to local news, Mexico gets a really bad name as being dangerous and full of narcos and don't go there. And, you know, I have found the complete opposite through my travels in Mexico. You know, truck drivers would pull up off the side of the road. They'd see me riding and pull up off the side of the road and give me water. They'd say, Hey, there's no gas station for 70 kilometers. And I saw you out here. I just want to make sure you're good. And it's like, Whoa, no way. You like took the time out of your day to stop and give me water. That's so cool. People invited me into their homes and fed me meals. And it was a heartwarming voyage all the way home. And I never, ever had an uncomfortable experience with any human. Yeah, wow. you've, you've got that. Uh, you've got that. Well, you have that positive aura going around you as well. So I bet uh, people can sense that. You know, it's like a karma thing. Like I need to give this guy water. This could turn around in my favor as well. Because I can tell totally. it's kind of real positive. You know, yeah, real positive I guy. That. I believe if you bring positive energy into a situation, people around you are going to feel that and feed yeah. off of it. And also, I could speak Spanish, so you know there was no language barrier, yeah. which definitely helped. And yeah, I'm kind of a happy-go-lucky guy. So when people meet me, first of all, I'm like a white guy in the middle of nowhere, Mexico, which is weird. So they're curious. (laughs) And so they start asking questions. What are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just riding my bike to America. They're like, what? Hold on. And then, you know, it starts this whole conversation. Yeah. that's And so you're doing the whole ride. And to think this is 2005. Is that when you did 2005? You did. So technology is like turning a corner, like maybe you got a cell phone and all that, but there's really no, not didn't. like, you don't, you don't, yeah, but you don't have Google maps. You don't have this and that. So, I mean, what were some of those challenges like 
back then, I hate to say back then for 2005, but you know, yeah. 2005, like how did you plan that out? Like no technology nowadays, yeah. you know, nowadays you probably have everything that you need. Um, but back then, like what were those challenges like going from city to city or maybe not making your next city and I'm wondering like, Hey, what am I going to do here? Yeah. You know, I was young and naive and I had the, like the spirit of an adventurer from the old <laughs> days. I had one map that covered Central America all the way to the United States. So it wasn't very detailed. And I had a little line drawn out of what I thought would be a good route home. And I pretty much nailed it all the way. I did the exact route that I had put on this map. And really, and this is, you know, I'm good at talking to to random strangers. And so there were many times I didn't know where to go. And I would just ask a guy, hey, I need to get to this next town. How's the best way to get there? And they would stop and tell me, and then it would like cause like a crowd of people to come over. Oh, you want to go this way? You want to go that way? You want to take a left here and stay off this road? The truckers were also very helpful. You know, they, they know the roads better than anybody. And that's essentially how I got home the whole way was just asking questions. I mean, that's- that, that would be an amazing series on YouTube. Just <laughs> not only bringing faith and humanity back, but also like, you know, showing like, you can do so much more than what you really think you can do. And yeah. all you need to do is ask a question because people want to help. Well, and nowadays people won't even drive across a city without having their destination mapped out on Google. You know, they can't even fathom like, oh, I'm just going to memorize this and take a left here, or right here. And you like, remember the address. That's how we used to do it not long ago. Uh, yep. My wife, my, my wife and I are four years apart. And that gap to me sometimes is I don't, it might just be us in general, JV left, but like I I've lived, we live in my hometown now and she'll be like, okay, we need to go to this place. I'm like, okay, I know where to go. She goes, oh, I'm going to put it in Google maps. I'm like, I know exactly where I'm going. I don't need Google. No, but you could get a faster route here. I'm like, yeah, the, the town is t- 20 minutes long. Like, I can see it. What are, we, what, are we, what are we saving one minute? Like we don't need Google maps right now, but she is a person. She can't even go across town without Google maps. It's, it's hilarious. Yep. And it's unfortunate. One of the unfortunate byproducts of that is we don't talk to one another as often anymore. Yeah. Everything is, can be taken care of with the cell phone. So you don't need to interact with your neighbors or, you know, get, get out and put yourself in a, some maybe uncomfortable situation that for me, those situations turn into magic. When I'm traveling, those are the best moments when you stop and talk to somebody and then, you know, they spark some idea and maybe they invite you over to their house or, they take you to a party or something. I mean, that's why I love traveling is talking to strangers. I had the same experience when I was in Costa Rica. It's like I hung out with people who were just natives or so I was in a, a town where there's a bunch of white people, but I hung out with all the natives and they were the friendliest people. I would talk to one. He'd invited me to a party. I'd meet a couple other people. Yeah. And then I was you know, going on some guy's little boat to teach me how to fish. And uh, it was just the funnest. Yeah. The best way yeah. to, to funnest is not a word. Sorry. Um, it's, like, it's, the, it's in my book. That is a word. Funnest. Yes, you can have it. <laughs> okay. Well, I think yeah. it's, yeah, you could, that is the funnest thing you could, you know, but, no, but I mean, that goes back to like when we were kids, it's like, that's how we got around biking. And mm-hmm. nowadays, I mean, it's almost, you see, like there's a lot of helicopter parenting and kids aren't really allowed to leave their neighborhood or whatever. And I was like, when I was a kid, we didn't have cell phones. We just rode our bikes for miles. And we just be like, you just got to be back. Like essentially before the streetlights are on, like you're good yeah. to go. And I feel like some of that's lost in today's society. Um, oh, yeah. That probably goes back to local news as well. Yeah, um, yeah it does. But shout oh, out, local, shout out local, local news, news. scares people. Shout out local news every once in a while. If you're visiting a new city, very fun to watch for just like 10 minutes, just to get a flavor of what's going on there. Yeah. Um, no, that's great. I appreciate that. That's good. I, I still can't believe you did that. Cause that's just, uh, you know, most people wouldn't just be like, you know what, I'm going to do it. Um, anybody, anybody tell you don't do it. Oh yeah. My mom <laughs> constantly would, <laughs> wrote, wrote me emails and said, please do not do this. She got her friends to write me emails saying, Ryan, don't put your mom under this stress. You know, um, lots of people told me not to do it because again, they watch local news or the, the United States media saying how dangerous and bad Mexico is. Yeah. And in in fact, I don't think it's really true. Do bad things happen in Mexico? Yes. But I always tell people it's usually bad guys killing bad guys. They don't care about some dumb white guy on a bike in the middle of nowhere. And bad guys, bad things happen in every city and every state of every, no matter where you are. So it doesn't matter. Watch, watch the local news. Um, So I want to, I want to move on to somewhere else. So another passion of yours is running and you're not just like you said, you're, you know, an endurance athlete, but that is, 
that is not really saying that you are because people who do sprint triathlons or other things think that they're endurance, which they are in their own yeah. capacity. Right. <laughs> so you've done ultra marathons, including the Leadville 100, which, uh, Nick bear just did as well. I don't know if you saw him and, and yeah, I saw him. I was, he was, he was in front of me at the beginning. I'm like, that dude is jacked. And I didn't know who he was until afterwards. Everybody's like, Oh, Nick bear. <laughs> dude, he is nuts. I, he, he was marathon training. It was like running like six thirties, six thirty marathon pace. Wow. And he's huge. Yeah, he's big. Yeah. I'm like, when I see him run, I'm like, you are the furthest, but I digress. So when, when did you, when did you start running? And was that like the sport that you did in high school? And then how did that transition to like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go from a 5k to a 10k to a half marathon to a marathon. And when, when did marathons not become enough? <laughs> nothing's ever enough <laughs> so i have been i've been a runner essentially my whole life ever since i was in elementary school i've loved running i was always the fast kid in gym class we had a, a, a yearly one mile race at our school and i took it really seriously i loved to win it and i did cross country and track all growing up in high school and so i've always been a runner and you know for a while i, I was pretty good but then everybody else caught up to me and i wasn't the best anymore but after that, I really started looking at running as a way to just explore the world and be outside in nature. Boulder's a beautiful place and there's trails everywhere. So I just loved being outside and moving my body and feeling stronger. And so, yeah, you know, I did my most of my runs and races back in my, you know, teen days were 5Ks and 10Ks. And then I tried my first marathon when I was 18. I was an exchange student in Sweden and ran a marathon there because my older Swedish host brother was running the marathon and I wanted to be cool like Gustav. So I did the marathon and um, my first ultra marathon was actually at Burning Man because there's a 50 K ultra marathon at Burning Man. And I was going in 2013 and I was like, I got to try this. It's only a few miles more than a marathon. And so I love the community of people and the runners out there. It's just so fun and supportive. And then from there, I read the book Born to Run, which is a very yeah. famous running book, which talks a lot about the barefoot running and all that stuff. And I went down to that actual canyon in Mexico where they put on that race and I ran that race and it was a 50 miler. And at that point, 50 wow. miles seemed insane. Like 50, this is as far as I'll ever go. I don't even know if I can get to the finish line. That's nuts. And I did that race and it felt great. And I loved the vibe and the people. And again, it's just moving myself. It's exploring. And then later that fall, I did my first 100 mile race in the deserts of Arizona. And that to me was like insane. And I did it and it was cool. And, you know, it sounds funny, but I, I love these really long races because you have so much time with yourself out there figuring out life. Like you have a lot of long time to just think about life when you're out there and going through the highs and the lows of the pain of being out there and getting through it and eating and the heat or whatever it is and getting to that finish line is just such an accomplishment. So, okay. First, first marathon in Sweden. Yeah. Just, I mean, I love how casual you are, but yeah, I just want to be like Gustav, like just, yeah. you know, want to be cool. Casually going to run a marathon. So you were, you were obviously running at that point, training and, and have, yeah, been, I, been, I, been, I ran, but to me, at age 18, 26 miles was nuts. The furth furthest I'd ever raced was a 10K. Oh, a marathon man. is four 10Ks. Yeah. It's yeah. You know, 42 kilometers. So, uh, yeah, it was intimidating. But again, it was a cool way to explore the city that I was in, running around and like, wow, and there's all these people. I love the energy at running races. I love, I, yeah. I think, I think running through a city is by far the best way to, to see it and to understand it and to, to, to get a different perspective. I, I used to travel a lot for work and I would run through every city the first night I got there. And I think it was the, the greatest place and greatest yeah. way to learn the, the city itself. It's cool. I love yeah. that. And so yeah. then you go to Burning Man, which I would say like most people, the thought going to Burning Man is not like, uh, I'm going to go run. Yeah. I'm going to run a 50 K my first or you time. Think you're running, so you're not. About like what they're bringing with them. Um, and so, yeah, like it, what's that has to be by far, probably one of the most interesting race cultures out there. Can you kind of explain to us a little bit what the culture is at burning man running a 50 K? 
I'll explain it, but I also have videos about it on my YouTube channel. Oh, so there you go. Anybody listening can go check it out. But yeah, it's it. nuts. So the race starts at five in the morning when it's still dark and people are outside partying like crazy. And for people who don't know what Burning Man is, there's 80,000 people in the deserts outside of Reno. It's called the Black Rock Desert. And it's this gigantic temporary seven day city of art and culture and fun and craziness. And so the race starts at 5 a.m. and we, you run the perimeter of Burning Man. And the first lap, you're running like through dance floors and people are partying. And, you know, in the <laughs> early days of this race, people are like, what are these people doing? Because we look like racers. We have numbers on and everybody's dressed up like they're running a race. And most people at Burning Man, even at Burning Man, think that this race is crazy. You know, and so you run through all these these parties and people and just you see crazy stuff. And then the sun rises across the desert. I mean, it's just it's a beautiful crazy wild experience i i can only i mean it's one of my favorite races i've done is the south beach triathlon cool and so my favorite thing would be like south beach the Mm -hmm. bars don't really close so my dad and i would always get like a little airbnb then we'd ride our bikes there and we're riding at like 4 45 in the morning and people are outside drinking partying still and they're having probably the same perspective as the people at Burning Man. Like, what are these people on bikes doing? Why are there like 40 of them, 50 at a time going down this road? That, I mean, I now I'm interested. I don't know if I could ever run 50 miles. Um, What's the 50K? You can do 50K. that. 50K. I don't know well, about 30, that. 31 miles. 31. Okay. So, yeah. Let me get, let me get, I, I just signed up for my first half marathon and it got canceled. Um, oh. But I think I'm going to run it with my dad anyway. But. Uh, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm super, uh, I'm, that's interesting. So for running, it's a spiritual thing for you, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, it gets you moving, but when did you have that epitome? When did you understand running was not just for, for fitness to you? Um, it was probably in my college years or even earlier. Cause when I was young, I was really good and I was all about winning. Like that was what was important to me. I wanted to be the best. I wanted to go to the Olympics. And, um, it, you know, I was good, but I was never going to be the best by any means. And I had to really evaluate why I was out there running because it was no longer about being the first across the finish line. And it took some time to get there because once you're like a really competitive athlete, it's hard to just go participate just for fun and, and like go from being the best to just like having a good time out there. So it took a little bit of while, uh, took a little while to transition to that. But uh, when I, when I did finally grasp the idea of it being just a time to be outside with myself, with nature and connecting with other humans, you know, it really, it meant a lot more to me than just winning a race. No, I can, I can definitely understand exactly what you're saying there. Cause I, I still have trouble with that with pools. I swam in college okay. and throughout my whole life. And so like, my wife is always like, let's go to the community pool here. I'm like, I don't really like sitting at a pool, like, cause yeah. I feel weird. I don't feel right. Like I don't just want to relax by a pool. Um, I haven't had, I haven't found that, that feeling that you're looking for when you run, but Sad I have feeling you'll get there. I have found well, it in running. I have yeah. found it with running now. I hated running, but now I do like the time alone. I like thought I like looking around. Sometimes I don't even, I, I listen to a lot of books when I run, but sometimes now I just run without headphones and have a good time. Look at me. I might've bullied, I might've bullied you into it a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. You got me into I it. I bullied you into it, but I, I resonate with you, Ryan, uh, quite a bit when you say like, Oh, like middle school, we had the one mile competition. It's like, you want to be the fastest. Like I resonate with that all day. Cause I was like, I'm going to be the fastest kid ever. Um, then once you get to high school, whatever, it goes away. Um, but that's like, you know, I, I find my solace in running now. Um, but I also find that like, it's okay just to run like a jogging pace. Cause a lot of times I go out there and try to kill myself and it's like, you don't have to do that. Like, yeah, you're not winning any, you're not winning anything. All the Strava, uh, King of the mountains out here, like basically Olympic level. So I'm not going to do that anyway. So you have to just find that space where it's like, all right, I'm just doing it for me and I'm doing it for mind, body, spirit, and enjoying ourselves. Um, but you know, there is that competitive edge and I know you have it because you keep running further and further distances. Yeah. Um, and you keep pushing yourself, you're doing cycling, you're doing that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's awesome. I, I love to hear that. Um, Oh, real quick question. The, um, just kind of pertaining to pushing yourself and kind of getting together and like, yes, running and cycling team, there is a, a singular sport, but you go into a team sport and then you look at more of like doing it together. 
obviously there's a lot of races, you know, I grew up with the hood to coast and things like that. Um, Mm -hmm. but you did the, the race across America as well. Um, that's a great concept for a race. What was like, what's like your quick synopsis of that? So race across America is one of the oldest endurance bike races in the world. It's best known for the solo race where somebody, one guy, many, you know, you're not on a team, you ride all the way across the country. It's not like the Tour de France where you stop and sleep. Like you just keep going and going and going and going. And, right. you know, the winner is the first one across the finish line. I did it on a team in 2015 and uh, it was a crazy experience. I, I had done media for it before I actually ever did it. So I, was, I knew what the course was like and what, what I was in store for. But yeah, we did it in about seven days all the way across the country. Um, And somebody's on the road at all times in the race. So we have a team of eight. Somebody's always riding. Then we swap out. And there's nobody's really sleeping because they're always like ready to go. And it was a crazy experience for sure. What's the route? Yeah. It goes from Oceanside, California to Annapolis, Maryland. So Oh, interesting. So straight through. Yeah, the southern U.S. and in the Midwest a little bit. Yeah. It's like the cannonball run for bicyclists. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just a uh, cannonball runs probably I mean maybe like uh 200 miles longer. Cuz they <laughs> yeah, got to go to New York. This is about 3000 miles. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean it, it actually it could be equal cuz you're who you know you're you're messing with small geographical changes on the on the ends, but they go through about the same side. So then Yeah. I think there's two major things that I want to talk about in your past before I move to YouTube. One of which is uh, your passion for TV. We've talked a little bit about wanting to be on like the real world or something like that. And you know what these, these shows on MTV, but you also lived in jungle for 30 days filming for the discovery channel. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit more on like how you got to that point? Cause we've, we are, we've already established that you can push yourself beyond mental boundaries, but how did you get there? And what, how did you find that opportunity? So I'll paint the picture. Most of the viewers can relate to Naked and Afraid. The show I was on was kind of the precursor to Naked and Afraid. It was called Out of the Wild Venezuela. And I saw a casting call for this show. It was very vague. It was like, do you want to test yourself against, you know, the jungles of Venice or even South America? It wasn't even specific where it was. Sure. Check. Yes. Yeah. I was like, okay, let's, let's, let's see what this is all about. And, you know, I, being in the TV world, I was used to going to casting calls and doing things like this, but I really knew nothing about it. So at first I decided to make a little video saying why I'd be good. And, you know, I talk about my endurance activities and I'm a good team player, blah, 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 all the stuff anybody would say to try to get on a TV show. And then, um, lucky enough, or maybe unlucky, I was chosen for the show. (laughs) There were nine of us total on the show and they dumped us into the jungles of Venezuela Um, without any food. We didn't have gear. We didn't have tents or sleeping bags or anything to be comfortable. And this is like, this is like no BS. This is not like man versus wild where you're you're staying in a nice hotel across the street. Yeah. This was the real deal. This was super (laughs) super hard. Just to clarify. Yeah, exactly. And so we had to work together as a team to try to get out of the wild. The goal was to get out of where we were. And so every few days we'd get a piece of a map Uh, given to us by the production team and we'd have to navigate to this new place and make our way to the jungle and you know they're filming everything and seeing us sitting us down for interviews it was a crazy experience but yeah i didn't really eat much food for 30 days i lost over 35 pounds uh we ate lots of termites and other bugs it was the rainiest rainy season ever and so we were constantly getting rained on remember no tents no sleeping bags it was absolute torture. In the moment, it sucked. It was horrible. But looking back on the experience, it was definitely very valuable. And I'm glad that I pushed myself to the end. The only game aspect of it was that everybody had a little GPS beacon where you could push a button when you were like done, like I'm out of here, and a helicopter would come and take you out. But of course, everybody goes into this thinking, I'm never pushing the button. I'm tough. I'm an army ranger. Or I'm a survivalist, and that we had a team of badass people, and um, you know, four people ended up pushing the button. Five of us made it out, and it was by far the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. How far was making it out? Was it like ten miles, a hundred miles? Yeah, it really wasn't as far as you'd think, because you know, when your body is not taking in calories, 
you deteriorate really quickly. So you're not covering huge mileage. So I think total, maybe 60-ish miles we covered in the 30 days, 26 days total. 26, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty wild. I was just looking it up. So yeah, you and you and four others made it out after 26 days. That's pretty crazy. Uh, Tara Filer, Grants Pass, Oregon. I'm from Medford, Oregon. A little bummed to see that she got evacuated out on the second, oh, on the 12th day, but yeah. second day, a little aggressive. We thought, no, we thought second, she would second make evacuated, it. second evacuated, 12th day, little credit, but I mean, come on, you got to be Southern Oregon tough. You know what I mean? <laughs> she's, awesome. she's awesome. I'm still in touch with everybody. We're like family, but it was so hard. And like, you can be the toughest guy in the world, but if you're not putting calories into your body, it's, I can't, it's hard to explain, but it, it's just like you get mentally depressed and you just can't do anything. You stand up and you get like lightheaded really quickly. And like just walking half a mile takes everything out of you. That does the show, you know, the show like, stopped for, uh, it stopped after that season and it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, that I'm reading. It was too hard. I think the audience didn't yeah. like watching watching us suffer that bad. It was yeah, uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable for people. But that's a little shocking though, because like if you look at um Survivor, a mm -hmm. TV show that is now 40 plus seasons, they're yeah. always saying they're in a super calorie deficit. So like but then during the day they're doing like crazy. I mean, those there are some of these challenges that have gone on five hours hours yeah and they get like nothing after that they go back and eat rice and coconut yeah. so i mean that's crazy to think like yeah. i guess at least in their their standpoint they're given they're given enough to sleep okay and to get that and they're given enough calories at at that point to sustain themselves maybe well, this is there's probably a lot yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say there's probably a lot of BS mixed in there and a lot of uh there's yeah. a lot of cloth over the and I think this was like what you were talking about out of the wild, like this was raw. This was just yeah. you guys out there doing it. Whereas these new shows, I had a friend who was on a couple of those real world challenges. He did a he did like three or four of those shows, and it's just wildly different than what you actually view. It seems like this was like a little too much. This was what you see is what you what you get. Yeah. And you know. It, for survival, so the survivor show, they're probably giving them food because humans are not animated when you're like starving. And if you're not animating, that's that's boring TV. Right. You know, and I think that's why our show suffered because we were boring. We were just laying around the whole time, just like, ah, this sucks. You know, but if you want people surviving. to do activities, they have to have calories. There's no way you could pull that off in starvation mode. No, I can't even imagine. I've not, I've never hit that, that point. Um, I may, I'm hoping that I, I fortunately don't have to, but yeah. we'll see. We'll, we'll see in life. Um, I, my wife, I literally have a tab on my phone to apply for survivor. We went down a deep, deep survivor, uh, binge session when she was pregnant with uh, Gabriel. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so I think the final thing that I kind of wanted to talk about in your past was your insane optimism that is just throughout your your whole life you've been an optimist so obviously the worst of worst times you probably still had a smile on your face you could see the positivity hey guys we're like out here in the wild we're doing something great where did this come from you know i don't know exactly where it came from and some people are just born the way they are and i think luckily i was to a degree or maybe I just learned at a long, young age that, you know, being negative or cranky doesn't get you very far in life. And, I, you know, I'm human. I'm not always psyched and bouncing off the walls. I go through tough times. I've had heartbreaks that have ripped me apart. But you can't stay there too long because you won't go anywhere. You go into a very dark place. So then you have to start, like, practicing gratitude for just little things, which will slowly snap you out of it. And it can be as little as the sun came out today, or there's a beautiful bird tweeting out my window. And you just start like thinking about, you know, the beautiful things in life, because life really is this amazing gift when we're out here, like even when it sucks, you know, there's still a lot of beauty to every situation. And I put myself into a lot of very difficult situations, but I'm choosing to do this. That's the big part here. And uh, I love it. I really love pushing myself and seeing how far I can go. And there's sometimes in life where you don't choose hardship. Life just hits you. And when you go through these voluntary 
challenges, whether it's an ultra marathon or a hard bike ride, it better prepares you for when life is hard and it's something that you didn't choose, you know, and you're just much more calm and you can just, you can get yourself through these tough situations. And especially in Venezuela on the discovery show, we had to practice that a lot because it was so uncomfortable, you know, but there were days where we're like, all right, guys. And we were a team. Luckily, we were a team. It wasn't like Survivor where we were playing against each other. Like we really supported one another. When somebody was having a tough day, a couple of people would rise to the occasion and really help out. And that was the beauty of our show. Yeah, that, that, yeah. that makes sense, too. Like I would have it would be very hard to be calorie deficient, sad, like kind of just mentally not there. And then someone's like scheming to get you voted off the show where at least here they're like, <laughs> Hey, they, they threw up like three times last night. They ate something weird. Like we got to just, we got to get something going here. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think, I mean, it's funny, a, a piece of advice I took from my mom a long time ago is wake up and choose your attitude. Um, and I think that's kind of like, you got to go in there with the, with the optimistic mindset. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a good way to do it. It's hard to stay optimistic though. I mean, that's uh, it, it can be a challenge. So there's absolutely moments um, where, you know, it's, it's really hard and it's okay to be down and bummed out. We're humans. We go through these range of emotions, but it's how we respond to the bad stuff or the uncomfortable stuff that really defines who we are. And you'll see the most successful people are the ones that aren't like, you know, eternally optimistic maybe, but they at least figure out how to get themselves through the hard times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's always the key. It's like, if you have a bad time, learn from it. You know, the next time you can go about it a little bit differently. Um, it makes you a better person. Talk, yeah. A hundred. Well, I mean, you're, you're constantly evaluating, constantly understanding. It doesn't matter if you're in sales and you, you, you screwed a deal up or something didn't go wrong. It's like, now you have the opportunity to reflect on that and say, Hey, what did I do wrong? Or what could I have done differently? Or how could I approach things a little bit different? And you know, what's the mindset um, going into it? So yeah. I love that. But I mean, you, you talk, you talk about success. Um, and that's, that's where I think we can kind of transition into like the present, the YouTube, what you do now, before we get into where you are now with your YouTube, which is, uh, we, we just decided earlier that you're the first YouTuber ever. Yep. Um, no, <laughs> I, think it was, I think it was June, <laughs> June 20, uh, 2006. So there yeah. weren't a lot of people out there YouTubing. I think we were saying like, I don't even think there were subscribers back then. We were talking about that. Um, you were obviously doing different jobs. I mean, just real quick before we get into, you know, maybe when you were going to full-time YouTube, what were some of the jobs that you were doing leading into YouTube? So again, now we're paying the bills for you to get out there and do what you love. Yep. So again, I wanted to be a TV host and uh, I got a degree in broadcast journalism. So I knew how to use a camera. I knew how to edit and I would get some random jobs with the travel channel, the travel channel back when YouTube came out was like, Oh, we need to make online video. That's the next thing. And so I made a lot of online video, short videos for travel channels. So I, you know, in a way I was successful. I was one of the first, you know, online host for the travel channel.com. And I was always going to casting calls because, you know, I wanted to be a host of my own show, not these little rinky dinky, you know, online web videos. And right. um, I had some success in the TV world, but it was just endlessly frustrating because I never had control over anything. And I pitched a lot of shows and it would go up in the development world and I'd get all excited and people would start promising me things. And then it would all crash down for reasons out of my control. And that happened over and over and over. And so it finally got to the point in 2015, I shot a pilot with Travel Channel. It was going to be the next big thing, or at least they said it was. And then Travel Channel got bought by a different parent company and they killed all the shows that were in production. And I was heartbroken. It was like a breakup with a girlfriend. I had put all of my emotions and energy into this project. And all the stars had aligned. Finally, I was going to be a host of a TV show and it, it didn't work out. So I was like, I want to have control. And so I was like, I'm going to build up my YouTube channel, hopefully big enough to the point where I can make a living from it. And I won't ever need to deal with the TV world and casting calls and having my heart broken anymore. So in about 2015 is when I really started taking YouTube seriously. We've talked earlier that I've had videos on there since 2006. But YouTube was just at that time for me, a place to put my videos up and showcase some adventures and, you know, send those links to casting agents so they could see what I was like on camera. 
But in 2015, I'm like, I'm done with TV. I'm going to be a YouTuber. And I started cranking out tons of videos on a much more strict schedule. I really tried to get subscribers. I became, you know, you know, inspired by Casey Neistat, essentially. And then what he had done. And um, since 2015, I've made about 70 videos a year. And these are all pretty high quality, high production value videos that I put a lot of my heart and soul into. And what I love about YouTube is that I get to share all aspects of me as much as I want. In the TV world, a lot of times I was just memorizing scripts and talking to a camera. And that could have been anybody doing the job. It wasn't like anything special for me. But with YouTube, I get to be, be me. I get to be wild and crazy or talk about hard times and heartbreaks or whatever I want. And I get to also interact with the viewers in the comment section, which I really love. I can never do that in the TV world. I love being able to help people on their journeys. The whole point of my channel is to inspire people to get off their couches and challenge themselves in some way, shape, or form. And my videos hopefully do that, but there's always follow-up questions and people email me and stuff. And so I love interacting with viewers in that way. So that's a very quick intro to how I got into where I am now. No, oh, I, I love that. And I think that's, that's really important too. And, and it, every, everyone that we talk to has this kind of unique, um, oh, is my internet getting a little disruption there? Am I, no, you're, am good. I, you're good. Okay, cool. I mean, everyone kind of has this, this like unique journey going into how they got started with YouTube and how they went to YouTube full time. And there's, there's always that, where does the, where does the scale tip, right? Where does it tip towards that direction where you say, I'm going to put everything I got into it and put it into YouTube. So that, that happened for you around in 2015. And I, YouTube then was, I mean, YouTube was taking off. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a little bit different, you know, nowadays, um, compared to then, but like, was there ever times and challenges, you know, where you were taking this full time and doing this where you said, I, I, I'm just not sure. And like, how did you overcome some of those, some of those challenges? Like initially starting out, it had to be a little bit scary going into it. Right. I still go through that stuff. Even today, what am I doing? Where am I going with this? And I think that's pretty common of any creator. So back in 2015, I put a lot of time into my videos, as much time as I put into my videos now. And nobody was watching them. I maybe 125 views or something. And it's like, wow. Okay, then I make another video next week, 126 views. Oh, wow, great. One more viewer. And for a long time, I wasn't really building up any type of an audience. And it was hard. Then I started second guessing myself. I'm like, is this really sustainable? Is this something that I can do and actually build into a real channel and make a living from it? I think my first check from Google AdSense was $1.60. It was a joke, you know, and it was scary. You know, at this time, not a young guy either. You know, a lot of people that get into YouTube are young and they're like, okay, this doesn't work. I can just go this way. I was like 37 years old going into being coming or trying to become a YouTuber. And it took a long time to really build up any type of an audience. And this is what I always tell people to this day who are like, I want to be a YouTuber. And it's like, you just have to be relentless. You have to really, really want to do this and persevere through the hard times and just continue creating content. And, you know, maybe you're not getting more viewers or maybe you're just getting a trickle more, but you're, you're becoming a better storyteller. Your production value gets better. I always tell people, Every single video I make gets a little bit better. And it's a fun process to be able to, to look and be like, wow, okay, I love this video for me. I'm proud of this video. And maybe a lot of people didn't watch it, but I love it. And it feels good. And um, so that's how it all started. And about two, after two years, I only had like 10,000 subscribers. So still, it's, it's a good number, but I'm not going to make a living from 10,000 subscribers. And then, you know, it just got a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. You know, a lot of people have some viral hit that launches their channel. I've never really had that. You know, it's just been a slow slog of just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think it's due to the fact that I'm really consistent. And I also, I interact with my audience. Everybody knows if you write Ryan Van Duzer a question, he will answer you and he will help you out. And that's part of my goal. I mean, yeah, that's awesome. I, I appreciate that. 
as well. Um, and I know obviously all of anyone who subscribes to us is, is loves that too. We, we like to be involved. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's just kind of nature. Mike and I are just, we've been diehard YouTube guys forever. Um, we do love that, especially with certain channels that you feel passionate about. And sometimes you get on the ground floor with, and you're kind of like, Hey, I've been following this guy forever. Um, which kind of brings you back to, to when you did start and then and we'll, we'll kind of jump into the, the present, but like when you did start and you say, Hey, I'm going to go full time with this. Were you already set on the content you were going to create or were you a little bit like, Hey, I'm going to throw out a couple different things to see what sticks. Like how did that process of deciding this is what my channel is going to be about. This is what I'm going to do. Um, how did that thought process go? How did you decide this is the content that's for me. This is what I want. This is what I want to share with people. Mm-hmm. So I have always wanted my channel to be inspiring in some way, shape or form. You know, I go, I go back to like my days of public access TV in Boulder, where I started a show called out there, where the goal is to inspire people to get off their couches and get out there. And I wanted that same, you know, vibe on my YouTube channel. And so when I first started diving into YouTube in 2015, that that was the underlying message, but I, I filmed a little bit of everything that I did much more vloggy style. Like if I'm going to travel somewhere, I'm going to like film me getting ready and film me going through the airport and all this other stuff. And it was fun right. to do that, but it's pretty rare that I, I do that now. Now I kind of get right to the point with my adventures. Um, but the underlying message has always been to inspire people. So I, you know, outdoor adventure has always been one of the big ones. I think back in the early days, I was a little bit more general with just travel and exploration, kind of like travel channel content where, you know, today we're going to go and check out this awesome old church. And I'm going to tell you about it where I wouldn't necessarily do that today. It might be a small piece in a larger video, but now, nowadays I'm pretty focused on, on my content being, uh, you know, running or bikepacking, cycling, and just everyday adventure where, you know, I try to make it relatable for people. So people who watch the videos are like, Oh, that looks like so much fun. I want to go try that. Whereas, you know, a lot of TV shows you watch, you know, man versus wild and it's entertaining, but most people aren't going to go out there and, you know, do that. It's just, it's entertainment. It stops right there. My channel, I want it to be, well, that looks like fun. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to write Ryan an email and ask him how to do it. And you you have characters on your channel from the beginning. So the the transition is clear when I look through it yeah. because the thumbnails change, the titling changes very, very clearly. I mean, I think the first one here is the Running Wild Cabo Caballo oh, yeah. Blanco Ultra. Yep. That's kind of the one where at that five to six year mark, you transition. And then the one thing that shocks me is right in the same vein, the Burning Man Ultra Marathon that we talked about 2015, that has an amazing thumbnail. Mm-hmm. Literally, like one of the best thumbnails I've ever seen. I, I don't understand why it doesn't have much more views. And so, but you, what you have is you have people who come into your channel that are relatable to so many people, yeah. like your mom, right? If you take your mom on a hike and someone's like, oh man, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, Moab. Mm-hmm. I could do that. If she can do that, I can do that. It gives people yeah. confidence. Cause like if they see you and then, you know, the first video they look at is like Leadville 100. And then it's like going on a hike in this area, like that, that hike's probably a little out of my range. Right. Mm -hmm. But I love the fact that you have multiple people in the vein here and multiple characters on the channel that make it a little bit more achievable in the sense of people. So yeah, very well said. And that's the whole point. I've done a lot of adventures with my mom um, because I love my mom and I love showing her the world, but I also want to show other middle-aged women that you can do these things as well. You don't have to be an elite athlete and have the most expensive gear. I'm going to go turn on my light really quick. Cause it looks like I'm doing a Halloween special. Well, yeah, I, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. I like that. You're slowly morphing into a Disney, uh, <laughs> and you're slowly morphing into what I would call like a, like a Disney, like uh, evil villain, which I, <laughs> I prefer. Yeah. I like the morphing going on and we might yeah. have that in. The sun's going you, down. And yeah. I just like, okay. You're getting into like a, better. like a, like a, like a Jafar biking thing that I liked. And maybe, maybe we'll see in burning man 2022. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. exactly. You never know. <laughs> But I mean, it's a clear, cha- it's a clear transition. Like a lot of people, they start the channel and we, we, especially nowadays, when we talk to people who have started the channel two or three years ago, mm-hmm. the titling, the thumbnailing, they know that this, that's a thing. Right. Mm-hmm. But the first person who kind of introduced me to the concept of, uh, 
using YouTube as a time capsule was a skateboarder, Carlos Lastra. He was on here. That's his, mm-hmm. that's his pro deck for revived uh, skateboards. Yeah, he's a great dude. Um, and he was like him and Mowgli were both saying like uh, another skateboarder. They were saying, I want to use this as a time capsule. Like I love getting views. I love having this, but like, I want to be able to go back in five years and see what I was like for how I've progressed. Uh, I want my kids to go back and see it. I want my nephews and nieces to go see who I was at that time. It seems like until that point, you were really using it just as a social platform to to host, maybe to send a, a reel to someone, but yeah. really was it. The Portfolio almost in the beginning. Yeah, the transition is clear here where you're like, okay, I'm not using it here. I want to make this my job. I want to go for it. And I love that you did it and, and you've been doing it. So since you've been doing that, how do you come up with what you're going to post? Like mm-hmm. you have a lot of ideas out here, you know, the Ragnar racing, you have your hiking. Um, I'm just in this one vein, so I'm going to change here, but you know, different races that you do different hikes that you do, how do you choose what you're doing and how do you to stay so consistent with that one video a week? Yeah. So I essentially, this is what's great about YouTube. I do whatever I want to do. I came from the TV world where I was told what to do. Like you're going to go to Texas and you're going to make videos about Tex-Mex food, which may or may not be cool to me, but that's, I'm doing it because it's a job. Right. Now, because of YouTube, I get to dream up whatever I want to do and go out and make it happen. And, you know, so most of my videos are of these awesome dreams that I've had that I've put together. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, you know, document them and, and release them. And a lot of my videos are experiential where, you know, the viewer is just watching me go through whatever I'm going through from point A to point B. And then some videos will be, you know, along with that, like, let's say the Colorado trail, I will make a video about this is the gear you need to ride your bike on the Colorado trail or the great divide mountain bike route, or these are the shoes you need to run an ultra marathon. So I want some of the videos to be like straight up, like helpful videos. And it's not like a story. I'm a storyteller at heart. So I love the story videos more. But I also realize that most people are going to YouTube because they want to learn something and figure something out. And they're specifically typing in, what gear do I need to ride my bike across the country? Boom. Then my video comes up. And, and so you're, you're kind of hitting a couple of points of like, you need to diversify things. And you need to have series because that creates an uh, uh, someone wanting to come back and they want to yep. see you finish the trail and they want to, Oh crap. Like, you know, it's video one, what shoes do you need? That's a gear review, which you can put Amazon links and all these kind of other, other things that create revenue streams. But like, how do you determine or, or, or do you determine, okay, this month I need to have like, I need to have a little bit of the series I'm doing here. I need to have a, you know, a gear video. Is there a recipe or is it really just like, Hey, I am still editing episode two of the series. Uh, why don't I talk about this? Mm-hmm. It's a good question. And I'm pretty loosey goosey about it. I know some YouTubers are very strict with their production schedules, but I'm like, Oh crap. I don't have a video for next week. Um, maybe I should uh, go for a bike ride up this beautiful mountain or something, you know? So there are some times where I just like fill in the holes really quickly. Um, but it's, it's very rare where I'm like, I have like eight videos all planned out in the future. Yeah. You got some good latitude though, to be like, Hey, I'm just going to ride my back up this hill, take a video. (laughs) Totally. Um, I have like a notepad you know, on my desk at all times of like ideas I have that videos I will someday get to. And those ideas are for when I have a hole. I'm like, Oh, okay. I need to get to this video. I don't have anything coming up this next week. Oh, I got a great idea. This is for any YouTuber out there. I, this is, I pride myself on ideas. Um, either you could do one of those ones where it's like, you know, at the bottom of papers and there's like, you pick a number that goes, Oh yeah. Yeah. You could just pull a tab and it could be one or, you get a jar and you get those tiny envelopes and you put ideas in them. You write them all down you keep stuffing them in the jar. And then when you run out of ideas, pull uh-huh. open the jar, pull open the envelope, bam, video idea. Bam. That's just a guy. That's just a guy just shooting from the hip here. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on <laughs> that you just talked about as well is that you it's, it's so funny. And maybe you were like this. Cause I'm like this. It's like, if my mom told me to do something, when I was a kid, I'm not going to do it. If yeah. somebody tells me to do something, I don't want to do it. If a, if a boss tells me to do something, I'm like, ah, you know, it's like I'm probably going to do it, but I'm, it's going to be at the last minute. Mm-hmm. So something you touched on a second ago, um, 
now you went away from TV, you go away from these things, you're making your own content. I feel like there is so much that is being missed from traditional syndicated television shows, regular television shows, whatever they might have. Um, corporations who think they are like uh, woke as far as like good content goes um, in that sense. And then it's like how much of it and of what you do now, it's like the what you produce is so much better because you're going out and doing something that you love and that you're passionate about. Like, can you talk about how that kind of changes your whole mentality of like how you create essentially? If that yeah. makes if that makes any sense to anyone. Yeah, I think it makes sense. We'll figure out an answer. <laughs> Don't yeah. you worry. You know, I, I love, you know, my whole goal is to create value in the world with my content. Every video I make, I hope that it reaches somebody, at least one and inspires them in some way. And that's what I love about the freedom of, of YouTube and the stories that I get to tell. Um, And sometimes viewers will say, Hey, could you do a video about this? And I'm like, Oh, that's a good idea. And so it's this community that I've built that I love where I'll answer everybody's questions and people know that if they give me some suggestions, there's a good chance I'll make it into a video. And I love, I mean, it really is a community and, you know, I have Patreon now and all this other fun stuff. So it's like, okay, yeah, this is like, it's better than I ever could have imagined being a TV show host where TV hosts can't really create that type of community with their, their content. I can. And that's the real special part about it. Especially yeah, if they're limited. It, like I, I watched uh, the Joe Rogan with, oh my God, uh, the guy from Fast and Loud. Mm. Uh, what's his, JP, do you know his name? Can't remember. I can't think of the name. Okay. Uh, but what he was saying is like, even his own, he, he got to the point where you wanted to be. He had his own show. He had a whole series. He had everything there. He couldn't even post certain things on his own social media. Like he posted a picture of his daughter at her birthday. And Discovery Channel told him to take it down yeah, because it wasn't part of his brand. Like, but now you're, you're the director of your own brand. Like I'm the boss of me. That's what I'm, that's, that's what I'm trying to get to. What I'm trying to to say is like, I, I just feel like these, these companies that are so late to YouTube and like it, I, they're so late to YouTube. It's like, imagine if you could go back, if you went back to them now, maybe you have, maybe you're in touch with some of these people. Like you, you got to feel so stupid on their end mm-hmm. for not being like, just let him do his own thing. And like, we're just going to tie some ads and stuff and promotional stuff in here and some branding stuff. That's going to be really low key, but we're going to put in there. It's like, how dumb do these people have to be to, to not get that? Cause everyone's so focused on like television. It's like, yeah. you know, those people are stuck with 30 minute shows with four commercial breaks and everything in between there. They can't even think outside of it. Well, and making TV is really hard. So many times I would pitch a show and they're like, we love this concept, but we don't know which advertisers would want to advertise around this show. You know, and it's like, well, that's so that's why we're not going to do it because you're you're not going to figure out the advertising model for this. <laughs> well, you know, it's so it's, stupid. It's and so that's where YouTube wins, and that's where YouTube wins because they're like, oh, uh, outdoors, and you keyworded Moab. Uh, yeah. There's a company that is, uh, you know, bike Moab, and they're putting an advertisement for this. They're going to pay you forty cents a person because, Hey, it's super targeted ads where TV has to be as broad of a stroke, but also like in the same color scheme, right? Oh, it's green. But like, this is a turquoise one where, Oh, and then when they can't fill it, they're like, let's just throw in another drug ad. Cause they'll they'll pay (laughs) us like great. Sick. Um, broad brush. And to go along with that, with, with TV kind of controlling your brand, you know, right now on my channel, I can talk about current events. I can talk about the environment or climate change or whatever, anything political. It's my channel. Nobody's stopping me on TV. Not a chance. You can do that. Yeah. Never. You'll get fired. But you know, and I, I do talk about this stuff. I talk about stuff that I truly care about and there are consequences to it. Sometimes I do lose followers. I piss people off when I get fired up about different current events. But when it comes down to it again, it's my channel. And it's like, I want to share my heart and my soul with my viewers. And you might not agree with me, but that's okay. 
<laughs> yeah. And to set the record straight for all the viewers that are watching today, um, Ryan's a big flat earther. So that's really where he's coming from. <laughs> that's what he's talking about. Look how flat the earth is. <laughs> just, yeah. Listen, give that, just, give that, hey, you, uh, listen I'm just, <laughs> just saying what you've been saying, just saying what you're preaching. No, I, I like that. No, it is nice to be able to, you know, if you say something that's like, it doesn't have to be crazy to be like, Hey, there's a lot of forest fires now. Like, you know what I mean? Why is this so, happening? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, that's good. I, I, I like that. It's just nice. I get very upset about these corporations that are very stiff and don't think outside of the box of how you can generate an audience, how you can generate a community like you've done. Um, which brings me to my next point, which is let's talk about milestones in YouTube. These are huge and they're huge, but they're also, there's an interesting way that we've seen this happen. But a lot of the times um, there, there's different kind of, I guess, feelings towards like, A, you know, Ryan, like what was it like for you to hit your first 100,000 views? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was exciting to hit 100,000 because for so long at the beginning of my journey, and like I said, after two years, I was still only at 10,000. So I'm like, is this going to take 10 years to get anywhere? This is going to take forever. But, uh, you know, it ended up being faster than that in about five years. And uh, it was exciting. And it, I was really, you know, I don't want to sound arrogant, but I was proud of myself because it was so much work to get to this right. point. And not just making videos, but the shooting and the editing and the marketing and interacting with the audience, everything I did to get to that point. And what was really cool to see is my audience was probably just as excited for me as I was. They were like, this is awesome. We're so psyched for you. Like, we've been waiting for this day. You know, and it's fun. Like, again, it's a community. They care about me. I care about them. They care about me. And it felt really amazing. Yeah. And that's like, so, and, and are you talking about 100,000 um, subscribers? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So 100,000 subscribers, that's huge. That's a milestone. You're getting your, you're getting your plaque from YouTube and you're, you're getting that as well. Um, what about like just a video hitting a million views? Gotcha. Gotcha. So that happened just this year. I had made one viral ish video like five years ago. It wasn't on my channel. It was remember the whole um, series of videos called shit people say or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I made one. Like shit, called, it'd be like shit, like Honda drivers say or something like that. Yeah. So tons of stuff like that. So I made one for cyclists and it went crazy viral, but it wasn't my channel, unfortunately. <laughs> but this year I made a video um, and it was a two hour long video. And I never thought in a million years it would go viral. Yep. And it was a video of the Great Divide mountain bike ride where I put in all the best shots. I took out a lot of the talking and I took out all of the music. So it's just natural sounds. And the goal was to allow the viewer to know what it's like to be there without being manipulated by music. And so raw just, audio. Just raw audio, nature sounds, the sounds of the tire crunching gravel. And that video was put up this March and to my surprise took off. And now it has like 1.3 million views, which I don't know is viral in these days, but for my little old channel, it was a big deal. Um, and it was a two hour video too, which means more ad breaks, which means more money, which means I'm a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love this because like, this is, this is well, and we'll talk about this and it's something we've been bringing up that just covers the last two years. And that's what it is. But ASMR has been kind of a big deal too. Um, relaxing sounds to listen to, like whether you're sleeping or something like that, you know, it's like, yeah. there's a lot of this ASMR aspect to that video as well. Um, that's just like, you know, you want the good quality. It's the sounds. It's, it's like you're there. There's, I don't know what it is. It's like, uh, a, it's like a home cooked like, meal ASMR. Uh, yeah. It's like, it's like remembering your childhood. So it's yeah. fantastic. Um, there's another hiker that we had on the show, uh, Craig Adams. I don't know if you, Oh yeah. Yeah. His stuff's yeah. Great. yeah. And, and, and we talked a little bit about like, there's two audiences that he caters to. Mm -hmm. There's the people who want to have the unedited 18 hour video of him hiking the Scottish bat. I don't know what they're called. Like the Highlands. Like, uh, Highlands. That's it. Um, and yeah, so they want to see like this extremely long uncut video with just music. And then there's people who want to see the shortcut, a little bit of voiceover edit and put it in less than 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I feel like you're in the same kind of boat where like, who, what do they want? Do they want to see the unedited raw video of you climbing and, and, you know, riding down the mountain and doing all of the trails and talking about the fire trail or whatever it is that you're doing, or 
they want to, they literally want to have a live cam of you running the Leadville, you know, 100, like what, what is going on in your head at that moment? So it's interesting how YouTube and the audience changes. And as you grow, you kind of, kind of have to balance those things. And you know, what's fascinating when I started YouTube back in 2006, that was back when the whole world was like, nobody has an attention span, make your video as short as possible. And so if you look at like my early videos, they're pretty short, you know, like, my people would be like three minutes or less. And so even when I, when I worked for the local newspaper and did videos for them, it was like short, short, short. But nowadays people watch YouTube like they watch any type of streaming service where they watch a series and they want it to be longer. They want to watch a 25 minute thing. They don't want to watch some three minute video and then have to navigate again through YouTube. They want to just sit down and watch a show and then binge through it. So a lot of my content now is series based where I'll do a big adventure and I'll make a whole series about the whole thing. Yeah, I love that too because I, I find I find like myself depending on what I'm doing. Like like if I'm at work and I'm I'm working on some kind of Excel or PowerPoint or something, I want to have a longer video because exactly that. I don't want to have to click through things. But if I'm putting my son to bed or if I'm just hanging out, I might want to like you know watch yeah. and figure it out. But if it is a series, there's a hundred percent chance I'm coming back to finish it, especially if I'm invested and subscribed to the channel. Um, yeah. so and, and we, it, and we had like, uh, if you're familiar with like the car YouTubing, Ryan, like we had the, the guys from car Trek on, which is like, these guys are very big in the YouTube, but like series now for them, it's like, they were like, we want to pay homage to top gear, but kind of do it on our own with a bunch of YouTube creators. And there's some of the biggest like YouTube car creators and the, the production side behind it is, is kind of a big deal for making these series. These series are starting to become a much bigger production value than what were you, it's funny to see the shift from one side to the other of television to now you see this production and going towards YouTube, um, where you have a full crew with you that's out there editing, shooting. Maybe they're, it's like, maybe they're a group of misfits, maybe they're whatever, but they don't have to be this like sanctioned, you know, uh, discovery channel production crew to go out there and do it. It's very interesting. The shift, the series has been big. Um, we know that's important, which kind of brings me up to another point where, and, and Mike, maybe this is true. Maybe it's not true, but the series piece has been very big going into COVID and COVID has been a big make or break point for certain YouTubers and what they do. Ryan, how did it affect your channel or what was the impact on your channel going into COVID? Like, were you a scared going into it? Like, shh, what am I going to do? And yeah. then B, like, what were the results after, you know, maybe the first year and then what you, your thoughts were after that? So yeah, I was a little scared like everybody. I didn't know how I was going to create content because most of my stuff I travel for, right? And uh, so I had to really pivot there and do a lot of local adventures. And the good thing about COVID is people were at home. They were starving for content. They wanted like positive, inspirational content because the world was so dark and scary. My channel is a good antidote to that. And another bonus thing, there has been a worldwide bicycle boom in sales all over the world because people are looking for a safe way to socially distance and be outside. And so they went to bike shops in every single country in the world. And now there's a shortage. It's very hard to get a new bike right now because they're so backed up. Um, because so, of you. Yeah, because of me and my channel. <laughs> Sorry, so if, you got, if you can't find a bike, go ahead and leave it in the comments. Say that Ryan was the problem. Uh, yep. Just let him know how you feel about it. He's the he first hard the bike to ride, ride, and I couldn't buy a bike. <laughs> first YouTuber and single handedly started the bike shortage. Uh, yeah, not COVID. They had, they had to get a Peloton so they could at least ride something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was actually pretty good for my channel. Again, it didn't like skyrocket my channel, but it was definitely good for my channel. I have tons of comments from people saying, "Oh, I'm in lockdown in Sydney." and your videos saved me or in Scotland or wherever. And it was really cool to be able to provide this type of content to people who were bummed out and at home and couldn't, couldn't get outside. So they were living vicariously through my videos. And yeah, that's like awesome. JP said earlier, you're in a pretty decent spot to have that. So mm -hmm. um, to be able to get out and be socially distanced from some, someone around you. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think my final question is about, the hundreds of mediums out there that that you can post on, right? You have Instagram, Twitter, you have Vimeo, which is a totally different platform. And I want to understand how you use that. But like, what do you do you plan content for each one of these platforms? Or is it more so like, okay, hey, I'm gonna cut up my YouTube video for social? 
I, you know, rarely, and I should be better at this. And this goes again with like, you, you learn more every day, but I'm not really good at promoting my own videos. I don't really cut up my videos and put them on Instagram. You know, I might film my computer screen playing a video and say, Hey, I have a new video swipe up to watch, but that's about it. Like I don't do Instagram TV or stories or, or not stories, but, uh, whatever. What's the Instagram's version of TikTok? Uh, <laughs> real, uh, real, real. Yeah. I, I don't do any of that. You know, sometimes I'll post an Instagram saying, Hey, I have a new video go up there, but that's about it. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. If no, that's no, no, that, that makes sense though. Cause like we're, we're, you're, you're definitely not the only person who said this. It's like, look, I spend my time making YouTube videos and that's the platform I chose because I chose it because I was part of a community. I wanted to be part of a community. I wanted to create a community and I don't feel like on other platforms, there is a community. Yeah. So do you post videos to Vimeo? No, I don't. Mainly because there is no community. It's yeah. not like YouTube. Yeah. You know, in the old days when I was more it's in the fair film, wasteland. Yeah. When I was in the more, the more the filmmaker world, I put videos on Vimeo because back then they're like, the quality is better. And this yeah. is where the real filmmakers put up their videos. And so I did that for a while. But when I decided to become a YouTuber, I haven't touched Vimeo since. Yeah. And I feel like they were, they were big in like uh, the, the early live streaming platforms because of their quality. Yeah. But now, like, I mean, look at Ford, Ford just released their newest cars on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, Apple tomorrow is releasing all of their items on YouTube live. Like it is become the number one platform for almost everything out there from a video standpoint. So, and remember I was the first YouTuber. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, well, yeah. That, well, how did, I think the title did. of the video could be listen, Ryan was the first YouTuber and it will be on a bike. We, we wrote across and, and, we, like, hey, you just make and we pride ourselves on research. <laughs> and then, yes, there's going to be a couple of asterisks in there, but we pride ourselves on our research. Um, no, I, I think it's funny because, yeah, you know, um, well, you bring up YouTube being the number one platform, um, Instagram, number two video sharing platform, still a 720p. Just want to air my grievances now. Wow. Yeah. Still a 720p. So in case you guys are trying to um, optimize your exports for Instagram, just remember it's still 720 <laughs> Nothing wrong with um, that. We were exporting um, 720p till about a month, yeah. month ago. So. How, how, uh, how important is Instagram to you? You know, I like Instagram. It's my, probably my second favorite platform. I don't go for it like I do with YouTube. I don't really care about followers and all that stuff. I post pretty photos on there and I try to write nice captions and I post a lot of stupid stories that are totally off brand from YouTube. It's like my day to day life, you know, right. visiting my grandma at her, you know, living home, living facility or whatever. So I, I like Instagram because it's simple and it's clean. But for me, it's not. It's not a, it's not my main focus. We, we see that often. The reason I brought it up is because you talked about reels and for like a Peter McKinnon or whoever, it's like doing reels They're you know, they're posting and showing what are the differences of putting it on. You have your YouTube like stories or whatever, and then you have reels and the difference in between. I was curious if you saw any difference there, but yeah, for some, some channels, it's like, I don't like my, my, the con a lot of the content that I, you know, absorb on YouTube, it's, I'm not the Instagram's like, great. I see it, but I'm going on YouTube and I'm watching it. That's where it is. So, yeah. And I'm yeah. lucky that my YouTube channel is strong enough to the point where I don't need to promote it through Instagram or whatever. It's going to get just as many views. If I just put it, post it on YouTube and never say a word about it on Instagram, you know, I've tried two different ways where I'm like, go watch this video on my channel, swipe up. It doesn't really affect the numbers in any way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. Um, no, yeah. I, well, Mike, I think you tell me, I think I'm, uh, I'm, I'm good. I think this, we've has been, it. this has been way more than what I expected. I, I've been blown away by, by the story. I'm, I'm sure there's a hundred more stories that we missed. And I oh, honestly, yeah. especially in the past section, there are a couple red strikes yep. on here. We wanted to keep it going forward. So there's definitely more that we didn't even get to uh, talk about in your past. Um, but I, I can't thank you enough. Like this has been an amazing experience. Thank you for bringing us back to YouTube and uh, thanks for having such a positive community. Cause you make me definitely want to get up and go out there. And you've, you've started to plant a dangerous seed in my mind of uh, wanting to run more than 
to 13.1 miles. 13.1. So. We got it. You could do 13.2. That would be more than a half marathon. I, I, I probably start will. just walking, start. walking around. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, uh, let, let's start there. We'll see how it is. And, uh, maybe we can all go do, uh, some really cool, fun race. Oh, there's actually, um, there's a, a really cool race in Colorado. I want to do, uh, emoji and pass. Oh yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. I've not done it. So. Yeah. Come to Boulder. Let's get rowdy and have some fun. And I really, I appreciate the time you guys gave me with your, with your audience tonight. And thanks for all the thoughtful questions. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. We appreciate it. This is uh this is our dream too. So we're just trying to, uh, trying to get out there because we want to do exactly what you said early on is like, you, you don't become TikTok famous overnight. Like I was telling my uh, little, little sister this. You don't become TikTok famous. She goes, oh, no, these people were TikTok famous. I'm like, oh, who? And then this person, I'm like, no, that person was on Vine. And Vine got bought like eight years ago. So th- th- that person's been grinding for a long time. So, you know, you got you to put the hours in. You got to put that in. But if you're not passionate about it, you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Which was actually gives me one last question. Um, and, and typically, we see this a lot. And I think a lot of people... That we talked to about building a YouTube channel. So I'm going to, I'm going to take on for an extra five minutes here, but, um, what do you like, what do you say, or what is kind of your advice for those who are, you know, maybe they are saying, Hey, I want to start a YouTube channel. What's the advice there. And then there's also the people that are weighing a decision that we see a lot of that's like, at what point should I be looking at stopping what I'm doing? you know, from like my professional job and then moving to a hundred percent YouTube. And like, I guess any words of wisdom around that, that might be able to help them kind of navigate, you know, what they want to do with life and how they can share their source. Well, first of all, if you're watching this video or listening to it, quit your job and become a YouTuber. (laughs) (laughs) In fact, Ryan, you already have a resignation later, a resignation letter written up for them. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I great. Take, I take pride <laughs> in convincing people to quit their jobs and do what they love doing. Seriously. Um, but it can be overwhelming. You think you need all the best gear and you need tons of money and blah, blah, blah. You don't. You really don't anymore. There are some YouTube channels out there that are shot entirely on an iPhone. And it's all about your story and your message and being consistent. And you really, it, it can get overwhelming and it can be scary. But I truly believe that if you have a story to tell and a message for the world, get it out there, you know, and just give it a shot. Just try. Because if you go through life and you don't do what you wanted to do, maybe it's not YouTube. You're going to regret it. You'd be like, I really wish I would have done that. Um, So all the aspiring YouTubers out there, I believe if some 37 year old dude can start YouTube and like create a successful channel, so can you, because I'm guessing most of your listeners are quite a bit younger than me. And you're at the prime right age to do this. And every human has a story. Everybody out there, a lot of people think, oh, I'm so boring. I don't have anything to say. Everybody has something to say. And it's, it's, you're worthy of it. And you know, when you make those first two videos and they don't get any views and they suck, just remember that your next video is gonna be better. Bam! Yeah, I could right here, more. sign out, quit your job. Ryan said it here first. <laughs> That's all we need to know. The resignation letter is available on his website. Yeah, you can check it out. <laughs> yeah, I will sign it. <laughs> it's in the description. Special two weeks notice. Uh, Doing man. YouTube, period. I can't, I can't thank you enough. So everyone, if you're not subscribed to his channel, go over and check it out. Um, you will be motivated to leave your couch and hopefully right now socially distanced and safe and get out there into the great outdoors because there's nothing better in the world right now than some vitamin D and seeing some beautiful, uh, you know, nature. doesn't matter where you live. I can guarantee you'll be shocked at what you find in your area and get on a bike, get out there and do it. Known that, yeah, you might not even known that there was bike trails near you. You might not even known that there's hiking near you. Just get out and do something. Do it. Yeah. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Everyone, thank you so much for listening. This has been an absolute pleasure. And we will see you guys next week with another episode.